Welcome to the SAG Aftrust Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Ben Lopez. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Latino Independent Producers. Before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG Aftrust Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG after artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given over $6.5 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a SAG after artist and need help, please ask. And if you need help, if, and if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Thank you for your support. Now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Eugenio de Res. Hi, Benjamin. How are you? Thanks for uh, giving Good. me the chance to speak to your audience. This is such an incredible opportunity, not just because we're in Latino Heritage Month, right? All year is Latino Heritage. It should be, right? A Latino Heritage Year for us. So exactly. uh, it's always a celebration to have you. Um, we, uh, your, your life is and career, your trajectory is so, so impressive and very inspirational, not just to Latinos, but I think by the mainstream public at large. And um, so thank you. It's an honor to have you here. Um, how do you feel about starting way, way, way early in your career, like early in life? How, how, do, you, how do you feel about that? Well, let me tell you my story. Uh, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Um, my mom was a soap opera actress. Uh, she was the queen of telenovelas. So I was born into show business uh, since I was a kid. And um, I fell in love with... Uh, acting because of her, with, because of my mom. And um, so I, I think I realized I wanted to be an actor since I was very little. Uh, because mm. every time I, I went with her to set, uh, I wanted to be on, 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 on screen. I wanted to be an extra or whatever. And, uh, and then uh, I started going with her to the cinema, to the movie theaters. Uh, when I was like, I don't know, six, seven years old uh, to watch, you know, Mary, Mary Poppins, The Sound of Music, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and then every year I was watching the Oscars with her. So I was really, really in love with uh, Hollywood, with all these movies that came from the U.S. And I remember that, that I, probably it was like, uh, I don't know, like around 10 years old when I told her one day, uh, while we were watching the Oscars, I told her, that's what I want to be. I, I want to be a storyteller. I want to mm -hmm. be there and, and, and make people feel what I feel every time I watch a movie. And, um, and yeah, and, and then I, I always dreamed with Hollywood, uh, but uh, life at the beginning, uh, life took me on another path. And mm -hmm. I stood in Mexico. I started working there, uh, trying to do a career. And, uh, and my beginnings were basically in, in another country, in Mexico. Excellent. So, so being, being a, an actor, a comedian, and, and, and having those type of aspirations in Mexico is very competitive because obviously there's a strong tradition going all the way back to Cantinflas, going all even beyond that, Las Carpas and, and the theaters and all that experience. Um, so I'm curious what that was like for you. What was like the first entry into that world? Um, were, were you naturally funny? I, I mean, I'm sure like for us, that's the myth, right? You were, you were born funny from the moment you were conceived, right? But I'm wondering if was it was it something that was honed was it nurture nature what, what was it it was very funny because uh i didn't realize that i was funny i i, I didn't know i was funny so uh, i think i was naturally funny because my 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 um fellows at school they told me that i was funny when i was little when i was a kid when i was in in high school they, they've been telling me you were you were funny uh when we were at school but when I was working, because my mom was a soap opera actress, I always wanted to be a dramatic actor. I always loved drama. And I never mm. thought about doing comedy ever because I didn't realize that I was able to make people laugh. So mm. uh, I kept trying to be a, a dramatic actor for many, many years. I was always trying to work in a telenovela that, that, because that was the world that I knew. 
Uh, and uh, for like, I don't know, like for uh, first telenovela I did, I was 12 years old and I kept trying to work in telenovelas until I was 27. So, and nothing happened. <laughs> and um, my career as a dramatic actor was, uh, it never came to an any point. It was just nothing. And one day when I was 27 year, years old, uh, they invited me to be a guest in a, sh a comedy show, uh, kind of like a Doris Day show with comedy sketches. And that was my first encounter with comedy. And mm. they invited me to do the sketch. I did it. They loved it. They invited me like a week later for a second time. They loved it. I felt so natural and so good. And I was like surprised by what I was doing. And then the third time that invited, they invited me, they asked me to stay as a part of the cast. And, and that's how I began to my comedic career. And my life changed from that point. Uh, my life changed completely when I became a comedian. That's, that's incredible. Uh, I, want, I want to go back a little bit into that ecosystem for people that might not know, they're watching this, this, this specific conversation, but they might not know what was happening in Mexico during that time, around the time that you were um, going through that transition. Because I want to know about a little bit more about the training, maybe the first acting coaches that you had and maybe some of the stuff that you were reading. Was it mostly tele telenovela based or was it also maybe theater plays and a specific level of training for the craft? I don't know if they were using Stanislavski or more telenovela style. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind taking us back to that moment, I'm, I'm really curious before, before 27. Well, I did everything I could because I really wanted, my mom was really serious about acting. Uh, for example, I remember she, she uh, I was like probably six, seven years old and she did mm. a telenovela called Maria Isabel where she, she was playing a maid uh, that she came from, uh, like indigenous maid that comes to the city and then she fell in love with uh, her boss and they end up marrying. And then it became like a very popular telenovela. Then they remade the, the telenovela Simplemente Maria. Uh, there were a lot of remakes in Latin America of that telenovela. But when she was training for that, she went to, the, um, to a small town uh, with, uh, and tried to, she, she, she let, she, I think she lived there for uh, like a week at least. And she was training without shoes and she learned the dialect. She learned uh, how to sing all this uh, oh. um, lullabies that they have. She, she was really into it. So I wanted to be like her. So I mm -hmm. studied, you know, Stanislavski, all those uh, method acting stuff. And also I went to Televisa where they had a school, an acting school. That was more for telenovelas. It was more like practical mm. and, 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 and easy. And I went through everything because I really wanted mm. to be a telenovela actor. But nothing happened. And all of a sudden, I, I'm acting in, in, in comedy sketches. And I never took a, a, a class. And, and I think there are no uh, lessons for comedians. I mean, they teach you how to act, but they don't teach you how to do comedy. Usually, I, I don't know. I don't know, probably here in the U.S., but in Mexico, there, no one is teaching how to be funny or how to be a comedic actor. So, and my mom was really surprised because I was, and actually I'm still a very shy guy. So my mom was like, I mean, I, first of all, I, she was surprised when I decided to become an actor. But mm. when she started watching me doing my character, she was like, you're like another person. You were always, a, you are always a shy guy. If, if, still, nowadays, if I go to a party, I'm in a corner. I don't want to talk to anyone. Uh, I'm very, very shy. But I, every time I put a disguise or anything in my face, I become a character. And I, I, I am like another person. I feel like free to express what I think. So it's funny. I have these two 
uh, personalities. <laughs> it's weird. That's that's really remarkable. Uh, so during this this era, right, this stage of your life when you were training, absorbing. So were you consuming a steady diet of of um, maybe European American content, and also were you watching? Mexican films or TV where you what was your 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 consumption like what were you learning from what were you reading books like where did you find a lot of this inspiration from well I was basically watching of course a lot of Mexican television and mm -hmm. a lot of comedic shows because as, as you said we have a, a great comedians in Mexico Cantinflas Tintan um Joaquin Pardavé there, there was a golden age of um Uh, cinema in Mexico in the 50s, 60s. So I, I used to watch all those movies, plus the, the, the television, uh, telenovelas, and of course, any movie that came from the US, all the Hollywood movies, I was the first one to be there watching all these movies. And, uh, and, and as I told you, since I was a kid, I really wanted to come to Hollywood. And I probably, uh, when I was like 19 years old, I took it seriously. And my mom said, well, if you really want to go to, to the U.S., um, she told me this is the, probably the hardest thing you can do. It's, you do it, it's not easy to go there and, and get a job. But at least you need to, to really train before you're going, going there. I mean, at least you start taking music lessons, dancing lessons, uh, everything you can, because there you need to act, uh, sing, dance, everything. So I started preparing myself when I was like 19 years old uh, to really come to Hollywood around my 20s. But then life took me in another direction and I became a dad. Uh, so I had mm. to start uh, working and I forgot about my dreams, completely forgot about mm. my dreams. So uh, all of a sudden I was just trying to work and work and work in Mexico And, uh, and finally, when I was 27, as I told you, I started to become um, uh, famous or recognized. Uh, and I started my own TV show uh, when I was 30. And, uh, and from then on, my life changed. But I did an entire career in Mexico and I forgot about my dream of coming to the U.S. Absolutely forgot about that. And okay. um, my shows became very successful, and thank God. And I had my own uh, style, very peculiar style in doing comedy in, in Mexico, and, and my shows got the, the best ratings. And by the age I was 42, uh, probably I was in the top of my career. And uh, my shows were the most popular shows in Mexico and, and in a lot of countries in Latin America. So I was very, very successful in Mexico. But that that's really, that's <laughs> something that I, I definitely want to cover. So they were successful because I'm sure you worked on, there were specific elements in that creative process. So it's not just you becoming a character, but were you pre-writing those characters? Were you workshopping them? How did they, some of your best characters, how did they become alive? How, how did you build them? Was, you know, did you have additional writers? Where did the inspiration come from? Because I'm curious, especially because at that moment, you're not just becoming famous, but people are hungry for new content every time in Mexico. It's one of the toughest crowd to please, right? So where are you writing those characters and how did one character lead to another and so on and so on? Well, I discovered this ability um, for comedy, and then I discovered uh, that I had an ability also to write comedy. Um, so I didn't know that I was in a certain way training every time. That I, I, I like to, to play with words a lot. I, I, can, I, I was like the, the guy who plays with words in, in, in Mexico. And uh, I had a character that's based just in playing words with, with words and everything. And, and, and it was really funny. And it was very, I, I, as I told you, my, my style was very different from anything you, you saw before in, in television. And also, I had a, a group of writers that back then in Mexico, it was not, it was not common. Usually, mm. uh, they just had one writer per show. And... I was the first one to reunite like a group of like 10 writers that they were able to work for me. They trusted me. And, uh, 
and, and we were together creating all these characters. I was one of them, so I was always writing with them, always, always with them, creating characters and breaking rules. That was mm. the first thing that I did. Is what like what uh, is prohibited? What is banned? What have no, no one done before on television? And once we found what we try to break all the rules and make something different. Everyone was always telling me, how did you, did they allow you to do this? I was like, because I was fighting for it. And I fought for years for one idea. I was fought, fighting and fighting and fighting every single day until they say, okay, do it. And thank God I, I broke a lot of uh, barriers. And that's why my shows were very popular because every single week we have like a big surprise for the audience. That that's really that, that's really remarkable, especially because people might not know a lot of the history of the way comedy worldwide has come into being. Uh, for example, here in the U.S., you had a Charlie Chaplin utilizing a similar uh, system of like having 10, 13 writers come up with gags and then he would improvise. And then from the Chicago School of Improv, you have like a Del Close, the godfather of improv here in the U.S. So you were combining the best of both worlds. So I, I'm very curious about that aspect of the improv versus the writing. So would you be writing the characters and then situations and then how much improv did you actually inject when you were actually rolling the cameras? I'm sure that people really want to know about that process. Well, I was very, very, very picky uh, with the scripts, uh, hmm. especially because I was always working with words. So I really, at the beginning, I, I really stick to the script and I, I was always like, and this is true. Sometimes we were arguing, I was arguing with my writers like for, I'm not kidding, like two, three hours for just one comma or a dot or a period or, a, or a, an accent. Should I say it like this or like that? And we were discussing. It, it, it was really like so precise that it was like probably too stiff, uh, but it was successful. But then mm. I learned that I need to lose a little bit more. So mm. once I reached certain level, and I started, ha started having um, important um, guests at my show, I discovered that I could, it, it was really funny to make them laugh and improvise and, and, and go off the script. So mm -hmm. uh, then it was like a second stage where I started playing with my guests. And uh, my, my job then was try to make them laugh and just keep going. And I was, I always told everyone, don't cut. No matter what, mm. don't cut ever. Even if the actors say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, cut, cut, cut. Don't cut ever. So there was a second uh, part when I, I, I had a, when I had a guest and they said, I'm sorry, I laughed. And I was like, what are you talking about? Who are you talking to? And I continued like uh, there was no cameras uh, and they even they, they felt bad because, oh, sorry, I, I inter should I keep going? And I was like, what are you talking about? So it became like another sketch on inside the sketch. It was really, really, really funny. So at the, I, I would say that I at the beginning started uh, sticking to the script. But then like probably a few years later, I started improvising a lot, but based first based on a really good script because mm. when you rely everything on improvising it's very dangerous because sometimes you're mm. inspired and things happen naturally and you could be funny but sometimes you know this thing this magic thing that ha happens is not there sometimes and it could be boring and i couldn't risk my mm. show or my career based on I'm going to be improvising. Don't worry. I'm, I'm, I'm good at it. No, 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 no. I, I always had a good script and then I could like go on and off depending on if I see something funny that I could bring to the table, I go out, improvise and then go back and stick to the script. I think that's the best way to improvise when you have a, a good um, spine, you know, like a good uh, uh, script and then you can start playing. That's that's a really incredible bait. You you leave nothing to chance. So there's there's 
perfectionism that you honed for a long time. Um, there's been some publications that say that in order to master something, you need to at least spend 10,000 hours working at something. So you definitely put in more than your 10,000 hours in that, that improv and the writing aspect of it. So by the time you achieve what you would say the, the pinnacle of, of the most competitive market, especially in comedy in Mexico, you were ready for the next challenge. So I was wondering, can you take us through that process? Because you, you reached the moment where, okay, I could do this for maybe another 10, 20 years. I could retire from this here in Mexico, but you had your sights in that bigger goal, that North Star. Take us through that transition. Because I know it was hard because I've heard other conversations of how much you struggle, even though you were obviously the most well-known comic in Mexico, but when you make that transition, take us through that process. Yeah, well, uh, I was 42 when, um, and I, as I told you, I, I was like in a very good place in my career. My shows were number one. Um, I have, uh, I was working with a network that they, they were paying me really well. Um, life was good in all senses. Everything was perfect. Uh, then, but then when I was 40, 42 years old, my mom died. She passed away. And I always say that probably it was her. But uh, two weeks mm. later, um, I received a call from an agent in the U.S. He said, I'm an agent in Los Angeles and I heard about you. I would like to talk to you. Um, uh, can you come to Los Angeles and have a chat with me? And that moment, I think that moment was one of the moments that I had many, many, but, but this is one of the first moments that changed my life because that moment is what like, holy cow, I had a dream. When I was a kid, I had a dream. I wanted to conquer Hollywood. I never did it. It's too late. I mean, already I have a life and a career here in Mexico. It's too late, but hmm, I, I should give it a try. Let, let, let's see what happens. So I, I call this guy and say, okay, I'll be there in a, like a, in a month. And then after hanging the, the phone, I opened the yellow pages and started looking for English classes, for English lessons, because my English was really, really, really bad by, back then. Still, <laughs> but I'm working on it. <laughs> but uh, so yellow pages. So I, I saw a, a school, a very popular international school of English. And, uh, and I said, I want Is that to English in Bar Barrera? <laughs> Is it that one? That, 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 that. Not that one. Uh, Not that one. Berlitz. One. It was Berlitz. Uh, Berlitz so, <laughs> and then, uh, but I, I said, I need something really intense. As, as I want to learn as quick as possible. So they said, well, well we have a course in, in Los Angeles that is very intensive, just an entire week. Well, I, I'll take it. So I, I went to Los Angeles for that, to study English, an immersive course. And then, then when I was... Uh, uh, in that week, learning, my teacher told me, go and watch Latino Locks. It's a play with Latinos and they speak in English. It's going to help you. And long story short, I went to watch the, 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 that play. And in a certain way, after a long, long time, I don't want, I, I would spend like an hour telling you how I got there. But many, many years later, well, not many, like three years later, I was, work, uh, I was working on Broadway with that play and being one of the actors, even without knowing what I was saying. And let me tell you why, mm. because they send me the scripts uh, and I always was, uh, I, I, I just memorized the scripts. I didn't, I, I was like, this is not funny. And even though I was trying to, to look at the dictionary, I didn't get it. I was like, I, I understand the words, but I don't, I don't understand the concept exactly, but I, I'm just going to say it. So I, I really repeated what I was, and also I made a lot of mistakes. I was already on Broadway and I was mispronouncing a lot of words. And I was, and lately I've been telling my, my friends that were there, I was like, what? You never told me I was mispronouncing these words. And they will, well, we, we thought you were doing a character. <laughs> they will, no, I was not. I didn't know what I was saying. So anyway, the thing is that uh, I started doing some stuff on Broadway but this was during my weekends. But before Broadway, mm. I was coming to the U.S. during the weekends, just during the weekends. Mm. 
And uh, after three years, we ended up on Broadway with that play. So it was kind of a big deal for me and surprising for my audience. But we didn't know you were doing things in the US. Well, yeah, I was like secretly doing it every weekend. And then when I was on Broadway, I, I spent here like six months. It was a short run. And then I went back to my country after I, I was done with that. And I started doing um, uh, some um, movies. I, I, I tried to go to movies, uh, to, to switch to movies besides my TV shows. But uh, so my, my career in television was still successful. But now I had this thing that I, I remembered my dream about mm. Hollywood. So I was trying now to do uh, 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 movies. So I said, if I, uh, I could do a, a Broadway play now, maybe I can do a movie. So uh, I started uh, trying to do movies first in Spanish, but they never gave me the opportunity, Robert. And it was like, uh, every time that I was asking for a, a job and I was really, really, I, I was surprised because my, my shows were, uh, uh, had the best ratings and um, every time I do a, a, a theater play, people showed up. So I didn't understand why they didn't want to hire me. And one producer once told me, you're very popular. You sell a lot of tickets, but Mexican cinema is different. It's very dramatic. And back then it was just about, you know, a drama, a uh, very art house, um, dark. They talk about uh, poverty and hunger and all these dark uh, places that they want to go. So they don't people to they don't want people to laugh. They want people to, to to be in another state of mind. If they hire you, they will immediately see you and laugh and, and they will take them out of the movie because it's like, oh, that's the guy from the funny show. They're not going to hire you. And I got it. And I said, thank you for telling me. And that was the moment where I knew that I need to write my own movie. So I started writing my own movie because I knew that no one was going to hire me to make a movie. So, mm -hmm. um, Besides working in the U.S., I started writing my own movie. And at the same time, I was continuing with my TV shows that were very successful. But I was not that in love anymore with TV shows because I've, done, I've been doing this for a long time. So now my mind was, I want to make movies. I want to make something bigger. And uh, I kept doing that for many, many years until Broadway. After Broadway, I said, I, and now I, I, I'm gonna try to do movies either in Spanish or in English. Nothing happened in Spanish. I was writing my movie, meanwhile. And one day uh, when I was at Broadway, Patricia Regan saw me on stage and she gave me the opportunity because she didn't know my background because she, she was living in the US, not in Mexico. And she gave me the chance of casting for Under the Same, Under the same Moon. A dramatic role, La misma Luna. and mm -hmm. La misma Luna, and that was my first opportunity doing drama ever in my life. So I'm very grateful uh, for Patricia for giving me that opportunity, and that movie really moved the needle because after that, a lot of guys from uh, in Mexico and uh, uh, especially they start calling me for making movies. Finally, finally. finally. So, um, yeah, I kept doing some movies for a, a while until 2011, where I got a call from Adam Sandler to make Jack and Jill. And I was very excited. I came to, to the U.S. to make Jack and Jill, and he said, finally, I can't believe it, Adam Sandler. Everything he touches is a success, and I'm... I'm one in certain way. I, I end up marrying him or his female version and Jack and Jill. So finally, I'm going to be crossing over. <laughs> Al Pacino's in that movie, right? Al, yes. Al Pacino is in that movie. You know, yeah. it was like, no, there's no way it's going to fail. It flopped. 
So, and nothing really happened with that movie and, and, and nothing really happened with my career in the US. So, but I got a great friend that it's Adam. I love Adam with all my heart. And then, um, well, then I did immediately after that, a TV series with Rob Schneider. And because Adam recommended me to, to, to Rob and I en ended up working with Rob in this TV series called Rob uh, that was aired after the Big Bang Theory. So I was like, finally, after the Big Bang Theory, here we go. Finally, I'm going to do the crossover. Nothing happened. It failed. So after that, Robert, it was 2011. And I said, okay. I started in 2002, 2011. I tried the American dream. Not anymore. I spent a lot of weekends, a lot of years away from my family. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. I already did Broadway, a movie with Adam Sandler, a, sh a TV show. I'm done. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm not frustrated. I'm really happy. I'm going to go back to my country and uh, continue with my shows. And finally, I'm going to finish the movie that I uh, started writing. I'm going to shoot it finally. And I'm done with the mm -hmm. American dream. I'm happy with life. Thank you. And that's it. I go back to Mexico. I do instruction not included. And that movie Became the highest grossing Spanish language film ever worldwide. And over a hundred million. Over a hundred million dollars. And, uh, and I swear after that, my life changed forever. But I, I don't want to be talking for two hours. No, this, 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 is, this is very important for people to see that. that it, it's not like it was going to be right away, that transition. It wasn't going to bear fruit, but... You were used to struggling even from the beginning, but um, there was a there was a moment in Adam Sandler's kitchen that I, I remember hearing you uh, retell a few times. I don't know if you're if you're comfortable sharing that moment where you were wondering why you were being cast there, and you kept asking <laughs> Adam Sandler, "Do you mind sharing that moment? Because that's very important." When I heard this story, I I, I thought, "Wow, wow!" Because actually, it's very prescient for people who understands the struggle of being an actor and as a creator in this business. Do you mind telling the story? Or absolutely, or no, 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 absolutely. Let me tell you, I was um, uh, well, I had an agent. Where, I never had an agent uh, before. Right. Uh, the first time I had an agent was when I I, I was on Broadway, two thousand five. That's mm. what my first time. And, oh, I have an agent. Mm. Wow. Mm. Well, my agents did nothing for many, many years. So when I finally, it was 2011. So from 2005 to 2011, they got me nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so in 2011, when right. Adam uh, called me, um, I said, yes, yes, of course. What should I do? I, well, they want to cast you. I would like it. Yeah, no problem. I'll do the casting, whatever you need. So I went to LA uh, for the casting and, uh, and it was not in his kitchen. It was in his office first, first. Oh, yes. Let me tell you. So I go to his office and I thought I was going to meet with the casting director, do the casting and that's it. But all of a sudden they say, well, um, before doing your casting, uh, Mr. Sandler wants to talk to you. Well, look. Personally, I'm I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna meet him. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's waiting for you, and I couldn't believe it. So I went into his office, and he says, "You know why you're here?" And I was like, "Well, not really." And he said, "Well, um, I have a Mexican crew, my staff in my house, the nannies, the gardeners, all of them are Mexican." So, uh, especially my nannies, when I was asking them uh, who, were, uh, who was the, their favorite comedian or what was the best comedian uh, they, they knew in Mexico, they mentioned your name. So, you are here because of them. So, I was mm. like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and then when we were shooting the movie, he said, can you go with me to my house so we, we can say hi to all the nannies? And I was like, of course. I mean... <laughs> I want to kiss them. I want to hug them. <laughs> Actually, I owe them my 15%. <laughs> so I went to his house 
to Adam Sandler's house and it was the most bizarre scene because I was there and uh, thank God the nannies and the gardeners, they were very excited and they wanted to take pictures with me. And there, there, there was Adam Sandler with the cell phone taking pictures. And I was like, I mean, guys, Adam Sandler is in front of you and you want to take pictures with me? I don't get it. But and then my world was like so bizarre, that scene. And we were in, in his kitchen. That happened in his kitchen. Taking pictures with the nannies, with the cook, with the gardeners. And, and he was taking the pictures and I was in, in the picture with the, with, with the staff. So it was very significant to me because that's what happened. Really, my, my people... Latinos in this country, uh, they're the ones that, that, that made my career in the U.S. Because they gave me the opportunity. Uh, since day one, like with Adam Sandler, where the nannies recommended me, and not my agents, the nannies. <laughs> and now, uh, um, every time I, I open a movie, uh, all my peeps show up. And, uh, and for me, it's very significant. That's why I'm very, very grateful with all the Latinos in this country, because, because of right. them... I'm here, not, not because that's of the context of them. Exactly. That's the context that I wanted to, to lay out for folks that you were right in the perfect timing of not only did you have a loyal audience because they appreciated what you crafted in comedy for so many years, but you were also at the inflection point where Latinos, um, I, I think at now in, in today's numbers uh, here in the US were $1.7 trillion in economic power combine that with Latin America. So it just so happens that your movie, Instructions Not Included, was one of the bona fide proofs, not just of your comedy star in Latin America, but actually the beginnings of you becoming a global star. And I think it's very important for people to understand that, that you were able to unlock what people had rumored for many years. People had been fighting for this representation and more people like you to be cast, but you actually proved it. And I'm so glad that Somewhere along the line, I, I think you did tell your agent, hey, you know what? Who reserves you 10, 15% is probably going to be the, the nannies and those folks. But we do thank this audiences for, for you owe it to them, but also the fact that you give them something special. So let's, let's talk about that transition into the craft of you now being a writer, director, and obviously structures not included, taking you into that balance between comedy and drama, because that's very exciting because now you're combining everything. It's like you're, you're coming into that Picasso stage where you're bringing into all the best years into that period that I think it's like, uh, it's about to open up what we're about to discuss before we get to, to the rest. So take, take us into that balance, comedy, writing, cry, laugh, you know, that, that moment where drama is comedy, comedy is drama. Well, when I, when I, I was very happy with my career as a comedian, but I felt that I was lacking something. And I remember that every time I went to the, to the movies, um, I, especially when I saw movies like uh, Cinema Paradiso or um, mm. Life is Beautiful, uh, they, they really made a profound, um, you know, uh, una huella in my heart, you know, uh, so I really wanted to, to do something Deep significant. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I realized that sometimes when people go and watch a comedic movie, they can laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. I, I experienced that with, with, with a lot of friends that they were cracking up at the movies. And then they, when they walking out of the theater and someone called them, was, how was the movie? We're like, eh, it was okay. And we're like, Hmm. <laughs> you were you were laughing really hard, and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what do you think about the movie? Yeah, man, it was okay. And I realized when when you just laugh, and you there's nothing else behind, you forget about the movie. It's not like tr transcendental, you know. It's just like mm, mm. one more mm. movie. I laughed a lot, but that's it. But if it has heart you might take the movie for forever with you in your heart. And I realized that because that happened to me with Life is Beautiful or Cinema Paradiso or many more. Um, so when I was writing this movie <laughs> that took me 12 years to realize, to, to, to produce finally, because mm -hmm. we, didn't, we were trying to raise the money and, and we, did, we, we couldn't raise the money for 12 years. Thank God. Thank God, because those 12 years, 
um, were really useful for me to write and rewrite and rewrite with, with the, the other writers. I had a, a group of writers too, but uh, it took me a lot of time to, to polish the, the, the final script. But, uh, but I, I needed that dramatic element. So when finally I got what I wanted, uh, I wanted a really, really strong story behind, uh, people went to the theater to see a comedy. And it was very funny because they were laughing and laughing and laughing. And then at the end, the, the movie, you it's just so bad. Uh, right? You, I, you think you watched it. You feel the emotion. You cry and cry with that. And I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't yeah. seen it, but please watch it. It's beautiful. It, it's one of my favorite this is my baby what can i tell you and um yeah, and and for me it was uh, life changing because because of many reasons i i at the, at the beginning i just wanted to be an actor in, in it but uh, for many reasons i ended up directing acting producing uh editing and doing a lot a lot of stuff uh, in the movie so i realized that i have this capacity to 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 do more than just being the funny guy. Hmm. Uh, so I, uh, but, but, but what happened after instruction not included open in the U S changed my life forever, drastically. Probably that's the, the turning point, the biggest in my life. It was like from one day to another. I remember that I was, first of all, they told me we're going to open the movie first in the U S and then in Mexico. I was like in the U S what for? Doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I remember that Under the Same Moon opened in the US. Eh, it did well. But I, I don't think it is worth it. Let's keep it for Mexico. What if, you know, piracy, I'm afraid of, you know, let, let's not risk it. No, 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 please don't do it in the US. But Pantaleon Films just uh, bought the movie and they were like, yeah, you know, this company wants to release it in the US. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. So it was a Friday, the, the day that it was opening. And I was so tired of, you know, of writing it, shooting it, uh, everything, and then promoting as the movie as hell that uh, that Friday I promised my wife and I prepared my entire life for a sabbatic year. Sabbatic year. I, to told, take it off. I talked to Televisa. I'm going to take a year for first time in ever. I quit a, a Broadway play that I, and not, not in Broadway, but in Mexico that I had. Mm -hmm. I quit. I quit everything because I right. wanted like a year off with my family. So that Friday after my last interview and that I knew that it was opening that Friday, I went for dinner with my wife and I said, well, that's it. The movie's not mine anymore. It belongs to the audience and we're going to a big trip and it's going to be a fantastic year. We went to sleep and at 1 a.m. I got a call. The movie is making amazing numbers. It's breaking all the records. And we're like, That's right. okay. But I was not surprised because I, at the beginning we we're like, probably the records are like, are like this and this. It's okay. I was happy, but that's it. Well, Monday, next Monday, three days later, they want you on the Jimmy Fallon show. They want you on the Larry King show. The movies broke all the records ever. And my life changed. And a roller coaster started on that moment. And I'm not sure. I, I, I feel that I'm still in that roller coaster, in that trip. So it's been crazy for the last seven years. That must have been incredibly validating. And I feel that it's very symbolic you waking up that morning because you as well as this sleeping giant that is the Latino consumer and the mainstream consumer of Latino content woke up at the same time because it just so happens that Latinos over index at the box office, 25% were 20% of the population, but yet we over index at 25%. But you woke up with them, los, los despertaste together roaring into the box office. And that's incredibly validating, bravo. Thanks for saying that. And let me tell you why. I've been, I've been working for Latinos for many, many years, probably for 30 years. 
in, 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 from Mexico in Spanish. But I didn't know that I was building an audience. I, I, I honestly, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that I was building an audience that was watching my shows on Univision here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I, I knew that my shows were airing here in the U.S., but uh, I, I didn't know how much. And they were running and rerunning constantly during for awesome. 30 years. I mm -hmm. didn't know that. So when the movie opened, I heard all the stories about these guys that were like, this is the first time that my mom wants to go to the movie theater. She's never, she lives here in the U.S., but she doesn't speak uh, English. So uh, this is the first time that she wants to go to the movies to see your movie. Uh, so uh, all these people that never went to the movies showed up. All the Latinos that were watching Univision showed up. And, uh, and it's because a lot of things. First of all, they said, it's the first time we see like a movie that is not about immigrants, about uh, wetbacks, about drug lords, about narcos. It's a family movie. It's a fun movie. Uh, the character is a Latino, but he, he's a good, good guy. And they were telling me also that. Thanks for portraying us mm. in a nice way. Finally, it was very good for them to watch a Latino that was successful, that was respected, was, that was a good dad, that was, even though he was not speaking English because my character doesn't speak English in the movie, he was succeeding. All of that was important for the audiences. And then the story was really engaging and, and, and they loved it. So all this, I, I, I was not aware of this. So when, when it happened, it was, completely surprising for me. I, I was not understanding what was going on. So the next three months, Albert, it was crazy because my agents were, Eugenio, it's now or never. Right. So imagine I had to make the decision in, the ne in just in three months, if I should shut down my entire life, quit the company I was working for, that, that they were paying me really well, uh, shut down my office, my production office, my writers, my team, everything. I, como dicen, I quemé las naves. I burned my sh ships, and uh, I shut down my life in Mexico. I took an airplane. Three, four months later, a few months later, four or five months later, and I went to Los Angeles to start a new life, in a new language, with a new team with a new everything, even with a new baby, because my wife was pregnant at that moment and we had a baby one month later after we landed in the US. So it was like starting all over again. I felt that I was in, 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 in another body, in another one's body, waking up every morning, watching another house, driving another car, going to another office, talking in another language, going back and seeing a new baby, it was like, this is not my life. This is not me. But it was exciting at the same time. It was crazy, crazy. So at, at this point of you're in uncharted territory, right? Because usually when you have like some sort of crossover effect, right? I think before that it was like Salma Hayek and a few other people that were still trying to make headway in the industry. But you were specifically on the comedy side, the pioneer. So there's really nobody that you could have consulted with except maybe the people that were successful on the U.S. side. So you have to build your own plan. So this is where I'm wondering if you can transition us into in order, because there was no blueprint, you had to come up with a blueprint. You had to bring in new partners. You probably had to create a new entity, a new company, a new partnership that could take you into this new era of where you're currently riding the, the other wave right? Almost like a surfer riding the next wave of, of validation from your audience. So do you mind taking us into your wall creating, your writing screenplays, your create, you're directing yourself, but now you're creating a company that wants to take on more projects? Well, uh, it's very interesting because as, as exactly as you said, it, it was, uh, I was afraid of starting in a country that I, I, I didn't know the culture. I, I didn't know uh, how to, how can I say this? In my country, I, I, I was used to doing whatever I wanted. I was like, really, uh, the, the king of my world. I, mm -hmm. I, oh, your domain. 
uh, my domain, I, 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 I can do whatever I wanted, write about whatever I wanted. I know the culture, I know the words, I know the language. When I came to the US, I was still, I'm still nowadays uh, learning English every single day because I need to be more fluent, but I didn't know anything about comedy. And we laugh about different stuff. Uh, every time, I, actually, every time I'm in a movie and I want to bring a joke, the director is like, mm, that's not really funny. I was like, but that's really funny in Spanish. Mm, no, you, may, you better say this. And I was like, mm, but that's not really funny in my country. But it is in English. Mm, okay. So it's always that struggle. We don't laugh at the same things. Some of them. Right. But we're very different. So trying to find the way to crack it. Because I didn't want to come here to do movies in Spanish. I came to the U.S. to start a new career and, and start uh, uh, doing comedy in English with my style. So I was very mm -hmm. clear. I'm not going to beat ever a comedian that was born here. Anyone. I'm, I'm not going to be this close to Adam Sandler or Ben Stiller or Will Smith or you name it, Jim Carrey. Because it's not my, I don't even know how to speak that fast. Um I need to, to do it in a, another way with my own style. It has to be my way, but still try to get into the English, the general market. So I, I got a, a very um, an amazing partner called Ben Odell that he knows the industry really well. And we started this company called Tripas. It's a, a, mm. a three and then P-A-S, Tripas. Mm -hmm. And it's because mm -hmm. Tripas means guts. Mm -hmm. And we put this name to play with, because I play with words all the time. So it's three pass. That means guts because you take your, you make your decisions with your guts. And um, exactly. And then uh, we started this uh, company trying to create our first movie. And I was like, I need another instruction not included. But uh, everything was so crazy. I was trying to, you know, after moving to another country, I was still dealing with a lot of stuff. So I didn't have enough time to, uh, to write. So a lot of scripts came in and they were really funny, but I wanted more. I wanted this hard element. So the first movie that was ready for me was How to Be a Latin Lover. Hmm. But for me, it was not enough. I was like, hey, it's really funny, but where's the hard? Uh, so I was, and they were like, forget about the hard right now. It's a great comedy. And I was like, well, probably for the US, it's okay. I probably should just relax and flow. And that's what I did. And I, I, I didn't want to do Latin Lover because for me, it was like too commercial or too just too comedic. But uh, I had to flow. And actually, it, it, it's a very funny movie. It's just a, it's just a funny movie, but it's it really is. funny. So... Um, I started doing, um, I started my, my, my career here in the U.S. with How to Be a Latin Lover. That, by the way, I got a panic attack a month before shooting the, the film. Benjamin, you can't imagine. I freaked out so bad. Uh, the, we had like this, we had a reading a month before starting. And, you know, I was so busy, like uh, still uh, uh, struggling with finding a house and, and uh, you know, a lot of stuff around moving to another right. country and, and the, the office and the career and everything and closing down a lot of stuff still in Mexico and it was a roller coaster. So for some reason, when I went to the last, last reading, they told me we have a reading. I was like, I, I, I don't need to read, right? And they were like, yes. Yeah, you're the, the, the main character. What I was like, but it's not my first language. I'm going to uh, stumble and they, they're going to think that I, I, I can't even speak. So can somebody read for me? And like, okay, let, we'll put someone to read for you. And tell them that I, I, I want to I, I wanna sense the movie and, and tell them that I, it's the because I, that's the way I work. So Eugenio right. likes to hear everything to real. It was not bad. It was not, I was afraid of of reading. <laughs> anyway, they hired, well, we had amazing actors, amazing actors reading. And uh, after we end up the, the, the reading, I was shocked. And I was like, I can't do this. I can't even read it. 
I wouldn't be able to act it. So I went with my, uh, to my house with my wife and I was like, I came inside the room, I turned off the TV and I hold her by the shoulders and I was like, listen to me, I'm not kidding. I can't do this, I can't. I need to tell them they're gonna spend a lot of money and I, I don't want them to lose money because of me. I can't do this, I have to be honest. I, I can't. And she was like, calm down. No, I'm sweating. I, 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 I can't do this. So anyway, I had to hire a person 24-7, 24-7 to rehearse. Okay. Every single moment, every single moment. So uh, that's the only way I nailed it. And I, I could do, uh, and now I'm very confident about it. But the, at the beginning, it was very, very, very shocking. So do, do you think, because this is really interesting because a lot of folks, even actors that, that are at that level, like you're, they still have this imposter syndrome, they call it. Even though you're like, did I get this far? But yet, am I an imposter? And so it happened to you at the <laughs> highest point of that, of that career, which is really interesting. You know, not at 27, it happened at, the, at this level. So I'm glad that you're sharing that because I think a lot of performers, a lot of directors, a lot of people watching this conversation, they can personally relate to that. All of us go through imposter syndrome, but at your level, you're humanizing that for us. So I really want to thank you for that because they need to understand that even while you're empire building, because that's what you're actually doing, you know, working with Ben O'Dell and, and your partners to build that. It's a juggernaut. It's a rocket that you're building. But in the middle of that, you're kind of like almost holding on to it <laughs> for your dear life. But it's still, you're injecting the nuance into those characters. Which, by the way, I also want to commend you for taking what people have seen as a stereotype, right? The Latin lover, right? That Latinos are always known. But you invert it. You inverted the stereotype. So thank you for doing that. You're making a super genius. But also the core <laughs> message que tiene corazón, it has that full heart, we can feel your passion. So I think at that moment, you're, you're hitting your stride, right? So you shoot this movie, it also becomes a hit, it becomes another validation for you. Tell us at that moment, what, th th from, this is where I see that you're taking more chances on the drama side too, right? Because now more people wanna, they see you in a lot of this specific screenings, they're seeing you on television, they see that you can hold your own with the best actors out there as well, because you're a good actor yourself. You're an incredible actor. So can you tell us into how surreal were the meetings now with people that I'm sure were your heroes from the US side, and now they want to start hiring you. They want to start actually doing more projects with you. Can you tell us what that's like? Because a lot of people can't relate. They're like, what is it like to go to an award show? What is it like to be in this space and still try to run your company, your career, all of that? In that surreal, it's almost like a Fellini movie. It, it feels like a Fellini <laughs> movie. You're describing this. Benjamin, it's exactly what you said. Uh, I, I feel like any of you guys, uh, any, like any human being in the world, I, I, I remember this is a very funny detail that will tell you how I feel. I was shooting back then in 2011, Jack and Jill. I was in sitting in a, in a couch with um, Adam Sandler and Katie Holmes. And they were talking and I was there looking at the set. I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? I, I can't believe I'm here. And I, I watched Adam Sandler's knee and, and I said, he's here. And I put my finger like, you know, like close and, and touch his, his knee. I was like, he's real. Oh, he's real. And I, I was touching him like, oh, yeah. I didn't want him to notice, but I was like, that's his knee. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm touching Adam Sandler's knee. So I feel the same. Uh, when I went to the Oscars to present the Oscars, like two years ago, I think so. Um, it was incredible. I was in awe still. I, I, I feel like, uh, I, as you said, the imposter syndrome um, every single day. I, I just went with Jimmy Fallon um, 10 days ago and I was the same. What am I doing here? Mm. I, I feel that I, like, like mm. I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm not supposed to be there, but I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the trip. It's very exciting for me, but I, 
because I come from this culture of admiring Hollywood for so many years. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. all this came to my life so late. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that I, it feels weird. But because probably when you succeed, when you're 20, 25, 30, but coming to the U.S. to start a new career at 52, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That feels weird. Fever. <laughs> you definitely earned it. Um, I want to I wanna build some time for Coda. I want to talk about this film because I've, I've seen it twice at least. And by the way, it, it, it was a surreal experience because I missed the theatrical experience, but I was able to stream it, obviously. And I, I think that in that role, can you tell me about that project, the role, and then what it was like to... There's so many layers there. So you can tell us where you want to focus in because... Not only the, it, is it a breakthrough film that's working with folks with disabilities, performers with disabilities, but in a way that is so empowering. And then two, you're playing a teacher that is giving you the honest truth and, 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 and using musicality. And I was, you disappeared into the role, at least, you know, from my perspective, completely. I, who is this guy? Who, this is not the best. This is, this is the, El Profesor. Like, he's teaching you music, pero con, with such a, an incredible take on this character. So if you don't mind telling us about that experience, and uh, I'm, I'm sure, did you have any doubts about the project? Or maybe, how did it come to be? And when you finally saw it, if you don't mind recapping, what was it like seeing the first screening of that? with, I don't know if it was the director or maybe with the audience, Sundance, all of that. So I don't know if it was virtual. It, it, virtual, yeah. Well, let me tell you. First, uh, uh, I love the project. I think it's an amazing, mm -hmm. amazing movie. Um, uh, I, I, I saw that movie like five years ago because one of the producers, the original producers of CODA, um, brought this movie to Lionsgate where I was working uh, by, back then. Um, and I saw the movie and they actually, they, they offered it uh, to me. Are you interested in this? And I was like, I love that. I love that. But probably it's too dramatic for my audience where they're expecting more like a comedy. So probably it's not on my wheelhouse. So, uh, but five years later, he called me again and he said, are you interested in doing uh, just as an actor? Uh, the, the teacher, the music teacher. And I was like, of, of course, I love that movie. I love that project. Um, and I, it was an immediate yes. Um, and then when I heard that, that uh, Sean was, the director was uh, thinking about casting real deaf actors, for me was mm. like a must. Because nowadays that you, when we're talking about inclusion and diversity, I think that this is the perfect, perfect, perfect movie where you are, casting real deaf actors, you're giving an opportunity to real deaf actors that, by the way, they're amazing. I didn't mm -hmm. know they were that good. They're amazing. And uh, they, they have this ability to, to communicate with just a look, you know, with just a gesture. They're amazing. And then for me, it was a challenge because, you know, I, I'm a comedian and thank God the director didn't, didn't know my background. <laughs> mm. very much he was asking me i would like to know more about you where can i watch some of your shows whatever and i was like no I don't I, i'll send you a link i'll send you a link i didn't want her to watch any of my background because i didn't want her to but because that happened to me before in mexico they didn't want to hire me to right. do dramas because they were no this is a funny guy and my my shows in spanish are too broad especially right. familia peluche it's a it's a peluche Peluche, it's a very weird concept. It's like an animated uh, live show, very um, politically incorrect and very broad. It's like <laughs> a, it's a weird animal. So <laughs> I didn't want her to watch any of those. So I was like, yeah, no. I'll send you a link later. Of course, I never sent anything uh, because I want her to see me with fresh eyes. Mm. And, uh, and that was good for me because she gave me this chance to be a, a, a different guy. The only mm -hmm. thing that we, we were uh, fighting about was that uh, my hair, because my I wanted the really weird hair, and she was like, "I don't, you look good like this," and I was like, "Yeah, but my audience, they know me as this forever. I want to do something different." So thank God she allowed me um, 
to get this weird look and change my hair completely and get into this character that I want to put a, a lot of uh, personality in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> it was a slightly based in my life because when we were building the character with Sean, the director, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I told her, why not? Uh, let's make this background where he is. Um, I think he, he was a very popular um, lead of a rock band. He was a rock star in Mexico, in Latin America, very famous. He wanted to make the, the, the crossover, but he fails and decides to finish his career and uh, ends up teaching music in a high school in Gloucester. And, uh, but he's in love with music. He's very passionate about music. And he discovers that he likes to teach people. And that's why he's so passionate, but, but he doesn't like to fool around. So that's how we built the, the, the character. That's why Bernardo is so different with the hair. And he has this strong personality because he's, he, he's, passionate. he's an artist. He's not a teacher. He's an artist that now he's mm -hmm. teaching kids. And when he sees that Ruby has this amazing voice, he wants her to become what he couldn't be. So that's what, mm -hmm. how, how we built the, the character, basically. That's beautiful. What about the musicality? How much uh, actual, uh, I, I don't know, did you take piano lessons? Did you tell us about that? Maybe really music? Because <laughs> you, you have to do certain tones, like la, 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 all that. That was beautiful. So tell us about that, that build up of the character. Well, uh, I, I took piano lessons when I, when I was a kid. I, I had, I, let's say that I have the basics. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew some something, a little bit, bit of piano, but I definitely had to go back to piano lessons. Um, so I stopped my life because it was a lot of work when I realized mm -hmm. all the things that I had to do. So uh, like for four months, uh, I started studying piano, but every single day and practicing like a, around five, six hours a day. And uh, even when I was traveling some days... Uh, uh, because I had to travel for promoting stuff. I was asking uh, for a piano at the hotel. I, just please, I want to stay in a mm. hotel that has a piano <laughs> so I could rehearse. So I that was, was your writer. Exactly. <laughs> so I was always rehearsing piano and learning this six songs that I had to learn. Uh, thank God I had a, an amazing coach. It was the same coach that coached Ryan Gosling for La La Land. Okay. So she was amazing. She was amazing. And, uh, and then I had to also have to, to learn how to, to lead a choir, how to direct a choir. That is a very specific movement over your, over your hands. And a, a lot of details of how you need to direct uh, a, a choir. And then I needed also to learn how to teach because it's a completely different thing. Um, you need to, to tell the, 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 the pupils what do they need to do in order to, to, to sing? So I had to take a lot of singing lessons with a teacher here in New York. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I took a couple of lessons um, physically and then via Zoom, but he was teaching me how to teach. So it was very interesting. And, uh, and, and how, to re how to request that some stuff for the, from the kids and how to be a little bit mean. I wanted to be mean, but not mean in a bad way. It's just that I'm, I, I'm expecting demanding. a lot from my demand. Yeah. Right. I, I, I expect a lot from them and I'm not fooling around. Mm -hmm. So I'm that, uh, it's that kind of teacher that makes your life miserable, but at the end you miss him because you know, he cares. Mm. That's what I wanted. And it shows, it definitely shows. So can, can, can you tell us about your, your experience watching the actual film? I don't know if you did it virtually in, in a room with like the different actors with reactions. Uh, what was that like, especially seeing the, the completed work? Let me tell you, it's, it's been a little bit disappointing. Um, because of COVID? Uh, no, no, not the movie, the, the, the experience of, <laughs> of watching the movie the in my house by myself, yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Because That's imagine right. Sundance, that is a beautiful mm. festival. And we won all the top awards. <laughs> I mean, That's right. it would have been the best Sundance experience ever. And I was in my home, in my house, uh, just wearing a shirt and at the, the bottom was my pajamas <laughs> and then a Zoom right. meetings. And we were, every single day we were learning, oh, we want this, oh, great. Toasting via Zoom, ah, good. <laughs> it's not the same thing. So it was a little bit disappointing. Right. I watched the movie 
in my house with my family. So I have never actually until today, I've never experienced the, the watching the movie with, a, with an audience. So mm. I don't know when it's going to be my first time. I hope pretty soon because we just go to screens for Q and A's at the end. So I'm really curious about watching the reaction of an audience um, because I've, I've just seen the movie in my house. I, I got to tell you that it's definitely going to warm uh, uh, the hearts of a lot of folks, especially your performance. It's very touching. The the, the use of, of sound and, and the, the way they handle those characters very in, in the most touching way. And so I got to tell you, uh, you have now cultivated a new generation of fans, but actual people that are taking your work very serious. So I'm glad that sag is having conversations with you because I, I think that the work of Latinos has been elevated. Now we're uplifting each other to make sure that we're, we're really doing that at that work. So I'm wondering if, well, because I, I, we're, we're getting to the point where I want to discuss that little boy growing up with your mom, having that dream, watching those musicals, watching the Broadway shows, watching everything that inspired you. And now you're at the point in your career that you actually made it happen. And you're still not done. You got, I mean, from, by the way, uh, Ben and I, we know each other from way back, you know? And so every time that I talk to him, he tells me, we got like 50 something projects in development. We got <laughs> so many projects. So I'm like, so you're just getting started. So that's also inspiration for another generation of actors that also are probably thinking, is there another chapter, another point where I can continue? But first take us to that little boy, Eugenio El Pequeño, that little kid that was dreaming with your mom. Tell us about what would he tell you now? Uh, I think uh, that we, would, we both would have a, a great conversation about dreams come true. I, I, I feel that... Uh, there was a point in my life when I, I felt that I was dreaming too high and uh, that I was like probably um, aiming to a point where I, I couldn't reach it. But I, I, I always wanted to dream high, and, but I, I always feared that I would not be able to, to reach that level or get what I wanted. And I was aware, but I, 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 I always wanted to try. And I've been like that. I prefer to fail, try, even if I fail, that not trying because I'm afraid of failing. Mm. And that's been the, my, my rule. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm here. I'm Every time they tell me, you have to do th this podcast. <laughs> I was panicked. <laughs> How long is the podcast? One hour and a half. In English? Yes. Okay. I'm panicked because it's not my first language. I'm always panicked about everything. So I would tell that kid, be confident. Mm. It's going to happen. Not the way you think. Not the way you expect. You're going to feel that it's not going to happen ever, but it will happen because you love, you love your career so much that life is going to concede this dream for you. So be confident and be prepared because the, the trip is going to be bumpy, but very, very fun. Specifically looking at, at your family now, you're cultivating the next generation of their vests that are going to continue to, to follow in that inspirational path that you've taken. And I see them being as prolific as you. So you have your kids that are now taking the mantle. What, can you tell us a little bit, any, any little preview about where this family is going? I mean, like, tell us what your best hopes are for, for, for I mean, we're talking about you so prolific even to this day. So where is that the best family name going? Because now it's really going for global domination, true global domination. Impressive. Yeah, well, I don't know why all my kids wanted to be in show business. Um, I feel like I'm at like a, a, a factory of... Uh, Child actors. <laughs> I should just charge 10% and retire. You should. <laughs> but uh, for some reason, they're really good. I mean, uh, uh, Vadir is uh, doing amazing. He just did a movie with uh, uh, John Malkovich and um, Bruce. Uh, 
Bruce Willis and uh, and another one with Guy Pierce. And uh, Aislin, my daughter, is uh, shooting uh, in Spain right now. She did uh, Casa de las Flores, House of Flowers, and it was very successful. And now she's shooting like two movies in Spain and a series. And then she's going to Chile. Um, so she's doing a lot of international acting everywhere. I'm very proud of her too. And, uh, and Jose Eduardo, uh, uh, he's doing a, a, his first a series as a, a starring, uh, it's called The Uncle. It's a project that I think you probably might know. It's called The Uncle, mm -hmm. but the, the Spanish mm -hmm. version of that, he's starring on that one too. And so I'm very proud of them. And, uh, and my wife is about to start touring again. She's a pop singer. And she's about to start touring in November. She's going back to singing. Mm. So I feel so, so blessed and, and so grateful with the audiences because uh, for some reason they've been supporting me and my family in, in all, every single way. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful to life, to the universe, and especially to my audience that they, they are very supportive always. Eugenio, you have given your audiences so much over all these years, decades of incredible work, touching work that I think it's, it, we're paying it forward now, you know, you already paid it forward and now it's, it's, it's coming back that energy this way. So for, for everybody that's watching this conversation with you, I hope that they were able to get a little bit more insight about your journey, your career, your experience, the craft. There's more. We could actually speak for another three hours, but I think it's important <laughs> that for someone who's as shy as you, you were very <laughs> given to this audience. So, muchas gracias. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for being part of this. No, thank you, uh, Benjamin, porque, because, um, you know, I, I, I know that for a lot of people, I'm a new face. I, I, I can tell that a lot of people are like, oh, who's this guy? Or why is he giving autographs in the streets? They don't get it. It's like, uh, because I, I live in these two worlds, you know, it happens to me when I go to a studio that uh, I arrive to the studio to see the producer and, um, you know, the light parkings go crazy. And, oh, Mr. Gervais, uh, I'll keep your car here in front. And it's, they park my car in front of the door. And then I go to the offices and they like, what's your name? Eugenio, I, I can spell it, write it down. They're so cold. And then I go back to the ballet parking. Mr. Gervais, with like living this <laughs> double life. It's very interesting. So every time I have the chance to explain a little bit of my background and my career to the audience, I, I feel really grateful. So thank you, Benjamin, for this space to, to, to talk more about my life and my career. Thank you very, very much. I'm really grateful. 100%. Thank you so much, Rogenio. On behalf of the sag After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, process, and craft with your fellow performers. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful. Yeah.